I can say firsthand that this is the greatest nation on the earth. Now, to every Canadian that's going to watch this on the video, I love Canada because I am Canadian. But as I've traveled and traversed around the globe, I have seen the effects of this nation. And as a Canadian, I thank you for your service and for those that you've given to service to protect us and to protect nations around the world. We just thank you for your service. It's a, it's a privilege to live here, folks. I, every time I get off the plane in Atlanta, it's my hub. I just get come back into Atlanta. I just thank God I'm home. Thank God that we, I'm able to come home. The infrastructure and the, uh, just the, the, the total experience of third world is chaos, absolute and total chaos. If any of you have ever been outside of the United States um, to a third world, third world country, it's, um, it's just unbelievable to think about. And, you know, we go over there with all the answers. When I first went on the mission field, I was like, well, if they just do this and do that and do this, you know. But it's a, it's a whole lot more than that. I was in Myanmar in February, and I just, just looking at the poverty, the sheer poverty of that nation. And uh, I was praying. I said, God, what, what, what is it? And he said, Stephen, you just preach Christ, and it'll correct itself. You just preach the gospel. You see, the gospel is the only thing that can give a man integrity. And integrity, capitalism depends or demands for a man to have integrity. And, but it's just, uh, you just preach the gospel. That's the reason why this nation is great, folks. It's all because of this one message right here, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Good to see you this morning. I've got a, a, something different to do this morning. I, I really like visuals. How many of you all like visuals? So I'm going to do something. I'm sure most of you people here this morning never noticed this little tree over here. And um, which I bet you there's, there are some that have. That tree's not supposed to be there. Now just hang with me. We're going somewhere. I'm not going to mess around with these little trees. And I went to Lowe's yesterday, or yes, last night. I bought another little tree, which I will return. You can't have it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and another one. And then... I even went as far as to pick up a bag of seed. Now, you're going to go with me here for a little while. I want to paint in your mind a picture this morning that I pray that you will never, never forget as we get through this. I want to talk to you about the law of harvest. The law of harvest. Stand with me with, for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to go to Galatians chapter number 6, verses number 7 through verses number 9. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 down through verses number 9. It says in verses 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Say that with me. For that which he also soweth, or that shall he also reap. For that, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit, or shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And it says in verses 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let's pray this morning. Father, we're just so thankful, God, for this great privilege of being in this house and feeling the worship, the, the, the presence of God that just so came down as we worship. We're just thankful this morning as, as your glory filled this house. And God, I just pray, as we get into this message, as I've sought you all week on what to say, I pray, God, that you'd give me an anointing that makes preaching effective. I pray, Lord, that you'd organize my thoughts and the intents of my heart and the, the, the reflections of my voice, that it'd be nothing but the heartbeat of God. And Father, I pray right now that you'd go by way of your Spirit and you'd bind every Everything that oppresses your spirit and your presence and the freedom of God in this house. I pray, God, that you do it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you for a little while about the law of harvest. Now, as we walk throughout this life and we encounter the day-by-day events that make up 
the framework of our existence, it would be impossible for us through all that we experience not to recognize that there are some absolutes built into this natural life that we cannot alter and we cannot change. I said there's some natural things built in that we cannot change. Having been written in the mind of God concerning the earth and its inhabitants, they become constants in a world full of variables, laws of nature that allow us to thrive within its limits or ultimately die physically if we try to push beyond their natural boundaries. Now there's certain elements of this life that we know not to test. Amen? If I was to ask you this morning, is there anybody here that would climb with me up to the top of the, of the peak of this church and jump off the building? I don't know if I'd have any takers. Anybody? After church, meet me. Anybody go outside, get up on top of that building and jump off? I don't think so. Maybe there was one. I don't, I don't think so. Why? Because we understand that there's a law of gravity. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in the law of gravity or you don't believe in the law of gravity. The law of gravity is there. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. And if you go to the Grand Canyon or you go to the top of this church and you say with all of your heart, I don't believe in the law of gravity and you jump, guess what's going to happen? You're going to end your life pretty suddenly. You know, you might say to yourself, I just... You know, that whole thought of fire and heat, I just don't believe. I, in my mind, my intellect, I do not believe that that fire is hot. But you know, if you took your hand and you stuck it in that fire, you're going to get burned, whether you like it or not. If you went to the ocean, maybe you're going to go on vacation this summer and you're going to go out to the beach and you're going to go into that water and you want to, in your mind, believe. I don't believe that I'm going to drown if I stay underneath that water. Let me tell you something, folks. You're not going to grow any gills. It doesn't matter what you believe there's certain laws in place that you cannot alter and you cannot change but yet there are other natural laws that we both see and understand to some extent yet still somewhere within the dark recesses of our soul we fail to believe that those God created laws will have any effect upon our life in any capacity whatsoever listen there's some things in this life even though they be there we just say well that's not going to affect me. That's not going to have anything to do with me. That will not touch my life. There are many different laws of nature that we could take into consideration in light of the gospel this morning. But the one law that God has arrested me with this hour is this, the law of harvest. The law of harvest. Now, we understand that in the natural, whatever vegetation you see above the ground, at one point that was planted, right? Every tree that you look at as you go up and down the parkway or wherever you're driving, uh, you know, on, in your property, on your lawn, everything you see above the ground at one time was planted. And whatever produce that we partake had at one time fallen into the ground and died, eventually springing up in the form of new life. Whatsoever is above the ground at one point was planted either by man or by God himself. At one point, it was a seed, a little tiny seed that was planted in the ground and allowed to be fertilized and grow. But to paint you a clear picture in your mind at the beginning of all this, I want you to imagine that you had one 40-pound bag of wheat seed. Now, you're going to have to use your imagination. This is grass seed from Lowe's. It's not wheat seed, so just use your imagination. But I want to paint you a picture. That imagine you had one 40-pound bag of wheat seed that averaged 15,000 seeds per pound. Stay with me. 15,000 seeds per pound. You could take this bag of wheat seed and you could... Yeah, that was good. You could carry it across, your sho across the road on your shoulder. You could take this 40-pound bag of wheat seed, throw it up on your shoulder and carry it across the road and plant this one bag of wheat seed on one acre of freshly plowed ground. In just a few months, what you could at one point carry on your shoulder has now turned into 60 bushels of wheat or 3,600 pounds of crop. And at one time, what you at one time planted on your own will now take 
many, many people to gather. Are you following me this morning? I said, at one point, you picked up a bag of wheat seed and you carried it across the road. You planted it in, a, in one acre of ground. You did that all by yourself. But in just a few short months of time, there's going to come up 3,600 pounds of crop and you're going to need some help to get it up. You're going to need some help. If there's anything that I've ever learned in my walk with God, it's been this, that whatsoever, whatsoever is true in the natural sense of things is more true in the spiritual folks. Whatsoever is true in the natural, God is trying to say something to you and I in the spiritual. It's God's way of trying to get our attention that through the voice of nature, we would hear as it repeats the voice of divine revelation. God is trying to say something to the human race whatsoever you plant in the ground will at one point come up and you're going to have to eat of the of your of your planting for you see whenever a farmer goes forth and sows his prepared acres or the reaper goes out and gathers in the harvest or the passers-by as we are. We just drive up and down the road as we survey the crop, as he looks abroad upon the fields waving with its ripening grain and fruits of various kind. There's a voice that continually sounds in the ears of each that whatsoever you sow, that will you also reap. Whatsoever you plant in the ground, that's what's going to come up out of the ground. I don't care if you take an, an orange seed and you plant it in the ground and you say, I want to plant bananas. It's not going to grow bananas. It's going to grow oranges. If you take an apple seed and you throw it in the ground and you hope for cherries, folks, it won't be cherries. It'll be apples. Are you hearing me this morning? It's this that I would like to bring to our attention here this morning. That there's a law called the law of harvest that not only pertains to the natural elements of this earth, but it also has a double meaning when it comes to your personal life that it will both affect your life now and your life throughout eternity. It's what you plant today that will matter tomorrow. I said it's what you plant in the ground this morning that's what's going to come up or that will matter in the life to come. But I want to look at an individual this morning from the Word of God, one that had great potential in the place of his beginnings. But as time moved on and the plantings of his decisions began to break through the fertile soil of his life, what came up in his final harvest as he exited this life was something totally contrary to the mind and the will of God. Every time I read the story, every time I, I'm reading through the Bible and I come across it, I wonder what happened. What happened to this man that at one point he had such favor with God. And oh, let me, let us, may we take heed to those around us lest we fall into the sa same self-deceiving trap as well. For so often individuals, they start out right, but somewhere along the way, they lose their bearings. I said somewhere along the way, they lose their bearings. They make one bad decision or so one seed of disobedience that spawns corruption within the ranks and decay begins to set in. Slowly rotting away at everything that they ever endeavored to become. Do you know anybody like that this morning? Do you know anyone like that? That at one bad decision, it says in 1 Samuel chapter number 9, verses 1 through verses 2. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphiah. He was a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. The Bible says that he had a son, and his name was Saul, and he was a choice young man and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders upward, he was higher than any of the people. What great potential, folks, that laid in the heart of this young man whom the Bible says was like unto no other in, all, in the whole congregation of Israel. What a place of beginnings. What would become of this man at the onset of his life? You look at Saul, such great potential. And so it is, folks, when God looks at your life, at the place of your beginnings, at the, the, that the mind of God is always the same for every one of us, that deep down with inside of the heart of God, he looks at you and he says, I want to make you a man of God. He looks at you and says, I want to make you a woman after my own own heart 
God said in Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 11, He said, for I know, listen to me church this morning, He said, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, but to give you an expected end. Isn't that exciting when you read that? That God said, when I look at you, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And you know, that's the plan of God for every human. For every one of us in this building this morning, every person on the planet, that is the plan and the mind of God. That he might bring you to a place of expectancy, a place of blessing and not of cursing. A place of peace and not of fear and turmoil. God said that every life that he upholds, it's in his mind to bring you to a place that you cannot climb yourself. Are you hearing me this morning? I said every time God looks at your life, He looks at where you're going. He says, son or daughter, I have a plan for you. I have a mind. I have a will. I have emotion. I have desire. There's things in my mind that I have planned out for you. But you've got to understand something this morning. That all of God's thoughts are subjected to your will. Amen. I said all of God's thoughts, all of God's plan, all of God's preparation is subjected to your will. He didn't make us robots. He didn't make us just, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. He, everything is subjected to your will. Whatever, you, whatever God wants for you is subjected to your will. God cannot and will not override your will. But he lays before you a blank slate. A freshly plowed field that never has a seed yet been planted. And this is what he says. He said, follow my leading and I will cause you to plant in right seasons. Are you hearing me this morning? He said, you just follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and I'll cause you to plant in right seasons. Follow my leading and I will cause an abundance of crop at harvest time. He said, you just follow the leadership of the Spirit of God. And he said, I will cause the former and the latter rain to pour out over your fields he said follow in obedience and the or follow in obedience the voice of my spirit and you will never fail for lack of fruit don't you thank god for the leadership of the holy spirit he said you just go out you go out and you begin to plant and every decision folks that we make is a seed it's a seed in our hand and God said you you just follow in obedience the voice of my spirit I will cause you to plant at the right time at the right place at the right moment you follow my leading and I'll cause the latter and the former rain to fall upon your life follow my leading he said I'll cause an abundance of crop to come up on your on your fertile ground listen to me this morning when the next person or when the person next to you is dry and withered when fields around you are failing for lack of substance God said I will pour out upon you an abundance of life yielding elements that can only come through the leadership of the Holy Ghost oh listen I've talked to many people they say well I'm just dry and I'm weary I'm down I've never had a touch or a drink in so long but yet my life I just feel like I'm weighted weighed down in the river and the Spirit of God is flowing And he's moving and pushing in my life. He said when the person next to you is dry and withered. And they have no crop. He said I will pour out upon your life. An abundance of life yielding elements. Only comes through the leadership of the Holy Spirit folks. It only comes as you're led of God. As you're walking in the spirit of God. Follow the leadership. Let me tell you something. In all of my life I've endeavored To hear the voice of the Spirit. To adhere to the voice of the Spirit of God. God, where is it that you want me to go? What is it that you want me to do? There's a lot of doors that have opened up unto me around the world. And, you know, there was a time, I think it was last year, and I was praying. I had planned to go to the nation of Papua New Guinea, where I begun my, I guess, my whole ministry. I was planning on going back there. I hadn't been there since 2010. And so my whole mind, January, my whole mind is geared. It's ge- I'm going. I'm going to New Guinea in June. I'm going to Papua New Guinea in June. That's where I'm going. And I began to plan and prepare. I got a hold of people there. I began to prepare it, make sure that this is there and that's that. But I never felt a peace about it. 
Never one time did I feel a peace. At all. It was all my own will, my own thinking, my own emotion. I want to go. I haven't been in four years. There's friends. I've got a house that I built there. A truck. I've got all kinds of things. People that I used to live with. I'm going. I'm going. And I could never get a peace. I could never find a peace. A peace of God. At all. And folks, whenever I, it comes to the will of God for my life. Whenever I'm trying to discern the will of God for my life, there's one thing, one thing that I always place before the Lord, almost like a litmus test or, or almost like a fleece before the Lord. It's peace. If there's peace, if the Spirit of God gives you peace, then run with it. But if there's no peace, you better back up and hold on and begin to ask the Lord some questions. I backed up. I had no peace. It was the month of May. And from January to May, I had no finances raised for Papua New Guinea. Nothing came in. Zero. That's another test. That's another thing that I lay before the Lord. You know, as a missionary, I travel so much. And if no finances come in, come in for it, then he obviously doesn't want me to go. But we, so I, I just, I began to lay before the Lord. And I got into the, into the, Church, I think it was on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, we were up at the, at the office. And I just laid, I went in and I laid. I said, God, it was like May the 1st. I was supposed to leave like the middle of June. And I said, God, I need an answer. I need an answer. I'm going to lay here. I need an answer. And I laid there, so I'm not leaving until I find an answer. And finally, the Spirit of God broke through. He said, Stephen, I don't want you to go to Papua New Guinea. He said, no, you're not to go. I thank God for the no's. I thank God, folks, that he leads us. He's so gentle that he leads us and guides us. Sometimes he has to say no. Sometimes he says yes, but I'm, I'm still thankful for when he says no because there's protection in that, you understand. There's protection when God says no. He said, no, you're not to go to Papua New Guinea. He said, but have you thought about Amani and Nabil? Amani and Nabil are my translators in, in the nation of Egypt. Now, you all know what happened in the nation of Egypt last year and the year before, I was on the ground the year before, I think it was 2012, when Christopher Stevens died. I was in Egypt when they murdered Christopher Stevens, our ambassador to Libya. I was on the ground in Egypt. I was in Cairo when they, stormed, when they stormed our embassy there. I was there. I know what it's like. And I, I, I hadn't planned on going to Egypt at all. That wasn't a plan in my mind. It didn't even come across my mind. But the Spirit of God said, Stephen... What about Egypt? Have you thought about a man in the bill? I said, no, I haven't. I haven't even let my mind go there. He said, that's where I want you to go. I got up from that prayer meeting, walked in my office, got on my phone. I called a friend of mine that kind of a connection to, to, to a man in the bill. And I said, Darren, have you heard from a man in the bill? He said, yeah, I just got off the phone with him. The Spirit of God knows. Yeah, I got to just go off the phone with them. I said, okay, so what, what's, what's up? He said, they want me to come in June, but I can't go. I said, really? The Spirit of God just told me that I wasn't supposed to go to New Guinea, but I was supposed to go to Egypt. He said, man, this is unbelievable. I, got, I called the man in the bill. I said, hey, what's going on? We began to set it up. I went over to Egypt. We did a, a missionary conference and a pastor's conference right on the Red Sea. And I've never in my life, folks, seen a move of God amongst the Arabs like I did then. I said, I've never in my life seen God move amongst the Arab people filled with the Holy Ghost for the first time. Oh, I just... I said, you, you follow the leadership of the Holy Ghost. You follow His leading. He said, I'll cause you to plant in right seasons. I'll pour out an abundance of life-yielding elements. He said, I'll cause it. In my lifetime, I'm not very old, but I've watched Him. I've watched His hand in my life as I just lay before the Lord. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And another miracle about that, folks, about that trip to Egypt is every bit of money I needed for Egypt came in in three weeks. Are you hearing me? I waited five months to go to New Guinea. Zero came in, but God said you follow the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Follow His leadership. This is the potential of a life that's led by the Spirit of God. And this is what God wanted out of Saul. He wanted to make him a man led of the Spirit. That's what he wants out of all of us. To make us men and women led of the Spirit of God. And what humble beginnings as we look at Saul at the onset of his life. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verses 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil. I love the Word of God. I don't know about you. But it becomes so alive as you read through it. 
Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it out on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Do you not remember the time when the Spirit of God separated you and drew you out, singled you out, and said, Son, I've got a plan for your life. Daughter, I've got plans that you can't even think about. Do you remember that? I'll never forget where I was When the Spirit of God drew me out, drew me off to the side, I got over here and all the Spirit of God began to talk. I love those moments. I live for those moments. I live for the times when the Spirit of God is so heavy. He speaks so direct. You remember that time? If you haven't had that experience, I I beg of you that you will. Oh, listen. Do you not remember the time of intimacy as God spoke directly into your spirit as a human, as a man or a woman calling you to himself? Maybe that calling is reaching your ears for the first time in your life at this moment. Heed the voice of the Spirit. Folks, listen to the voice of the Spirit. The Bible says that no man can come unto the Father except the Spirit of that Father draw him. And if you hear the voice of His Spirit this morning, don't just 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 brush it off as some other feeling. It's the Spirit of God Almighty dealing with you. Don't just brush it off. God has a plan. Maybe there are those here that remember that call but rejected it, I beg of you to turn around and heed to that call for there's no greater existence on this planet than than God Almighty calling you to Himself. There's nothing worth living for, folks, than Him. So here Saul stands. And in one moment his life completely changed. You hear me? In one moment his life completely changed. What once was a life without purpose and meaning became an altogether different thing overnight. I'm thankful for Christ, folks. I'm thankful when the Spirit of God calls a man or a woman that overnight your life changes. You wake up the next morning and you say, God, what have you done to me? I feel like a different person. Now Saul had direction. Now he had purpose and something was different about him as he listened to the voice of the Spirit and he started sowing decisions in the fertile fields of his life. You know what's amazing about Christianity? What's amazing about Christ is every one of us, just imagine when you're born, it's, it's just as if you're given a one acre parcel of ground and every decision you made up until then begin to grow and some of them were bad decisions. But you know what's amazing about Christ? You know what's amazing about the gospel? Is that when you come to Christ, He said every bad decision you ever made, everything you ever planted, everything you ever were, He said, I don't remember it anymore. And He takes His hand and He swipes it across that one acre of, 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 of ground and creates you a brand new slate. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing that the Spirit of God loves you so much that He take away the pain of yesterday, the mistakes of yesterday. I've met some people, some hard people. I wouldn't want to meet them before they were a Christian. Some of the greatest friends I have in this, on this life are people that once were out there. I mean out there. Their body shows signs of what they used to be. But at one point, God brought His hand down. And wipe the slate clean. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful that at one point in my life that His loving hand reached down and wiped my slate clean. Just totally redid, not even a makeover, just a total redo over. Amen. But listen, as Saul began to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God, he began to sow seeds of decisions into the fertile field of his life. And it's here that we must understand that Everything that pertains to this life is in the mind of God for you and I. Everything that pertains to our life is already fixed in the mind of God. But then comes the question, will you sow seeds of obedience to His will and walk in the Spirit of God? Or will you sow seeds of disobedience and walk in contrary to His will, sowing to your flesh because you think you have it better figured out? How many people... Do I talk to? How many individuals that I come across that, why do I need Christ? 
I've got it figured out. I've got life figured out. Why do I need to follow the leadership of the Spirit? Why do I need Him in my life? I know, I know, I know. But in reality, He knows. I said, He knows your life from the beginning to the end. He knows where you're going to be three weeks, three months, three years, 30 years from now. Why wouldn't you want to follow Him? But yet in our ignorance, we just, well, I just, you, you know, that the human nature, just stubborn. I know, I don't, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. But folks... Let me tell you something this morning. What will you do when you sow seeds of obedience to the will of God? I want to be obedient to the will of God. If he has a purpose, if he has a mind, if there's something in his mind for my life, I want that to be fulfilled. I don't want to miss that at all. If he has a plan for me, I don't want to run off over here or run off over there saying, well, I've got it better figured out. When the Spirit of God has a purpose, a plan, a will, I want to follow that will. Oh, but listen. Be careful how you sow. Be careful how you sow because in the end, you're the one that's going to have to eat of the crop that comes up from your planting. I said be careful how you sow, the decisions you sow, what you sow in the ground because eventually you're the one that's going to have to eat of the fruit or the crop that comes up from your planting. And folks, some of our decisions aren't good decisions. I said sometimes we put something in the ground and it comes up and it ain't. It doesn't look good. But we have to eat. 1 Samuel chapter 11 verses 5. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field and Saul said... What aileth the people that they weep? I want you to follow me here. What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. Now I'm going to just jog your memory for a little bit. The, uh, the Amorites came. I think it was Amorites. They came to the men of Jabesh, Gilead. Their, their Jabesh was, was a tribe of people that was in, within the, 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 the borders of Israel. Anyways, they were Israelites. And the Ammonites came to them and said, Listen, unless you come out unto us and, and, and be one with us, we'll pluck out all your right eyeballs. Ain't that funny? Unless you come and be one, we're going we're gonna to make you a reproach in Israel and we're going to pluck out all of your right eyeballs. So Samuel, or so Saul comes out of the field. He was humble then. Comes out of the field like David after the herd. And Saul said, what aileth the people that they weep? They had no men to fight for them. Now this is exciting. They had nobody to, to fight for them. There wasn't enough men. The Amorites was, was a whole lot more than what they were. And so they began to weep, and, and Saul heard it from the field. They said, what's going on? And they told him the, the, the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And listen, the Bible says that the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. And the Bible says that his anger was kindled greatly. Immediately, Saul began to operate under the leadership of the Spirit of God. He began to sow seeds of obedience into his empty field as he listened to the leadership of the Holy Ghost direct him through the first battle of his life. And what a victory, what a triumph when all the men of Israel shouted for joy as God led Saul to crush their enemies under their feet. Let me paint you a picture. Saul, the Spirit of God looked at Saul and said, Saul, this is what I want you to do. This is my will for your life. And Saul carried on his shoulder the will of God and he walked across the street and he planted it on a one acre plowed ground of field or field and, and the, the fruit that came up from his planting was enough for the whole nation to eat of. Are you hearing me this morning? Listen, Saul said, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you call me. I'm going to shoulder the will of God. And it's time, folks, that we stand up as Christians and say to this world, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I don't care anything. Only the will of God. What the will of God. What God wants for my life. Saul picked up a 40 pound bag of wheat seed of obedience to the will of God. He went out and he sowed it. A lot of people said you can't do it Saul. A lot of people, they didn't even like Saul. That, that God would anoint Saul. 
But he said, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you think about me or what you think about this decision. I'm going to follow the will of God for my life. And because he did, the whole nation reaped a victory because of one man's decision. One man's decision, the whole nation reaped a victory. Did you know that what you do in your life affects those around you? Amen. The decisions that you make in your life, they don't only affect you. So many times we think, well, I'm going to do what I want to do because it's only going to affect me. But folks, it affects everybody around you. Everyone that's in any relationship with you at all, it affects everyone around you. But what a harvest to be reaped as Saul began to learn and understand this principle of obeying the voice of the Spirit. The Saul, or the harvest of Saul's obedience found its way into every household across Israel. Men that used to doubt him, doubted him no more as God began to establish his goings. And that's what you're going to have to do, folks, as you walk with God. So many of us are so afraid of what this person is going to say or that person is going to say at work. Where, well, you know, I don't know what they're going to say. Folks, it doesn't matter what they say. What does God say? What does the Spirit of God say? Where, where is He leading you? Listen, and it's not, a, it's not a, a brassy thing. But we have to follow the will of God. Amen? I, I must follow the will of God. Saul, as we said, took upon his shoulder a 40-pound bag of seed of obedience to the will of God. And in return, he reaped a harvest that the whole nation could eat of. But you see, therein lays the beauty and the danger of the law of harvest in this life. That whatsoever you sow, not only you will reap it, but it will spill over into the lives that are closest to you. And you know, if you're a man or a woman of God, people will flock to be around you because you sow to the obedience of the Spirit of God and the favor of God surrounds you. As you walk with God, people recognize that in you. There's so certain qualities and attributes about your character that's different from this world. And it attracts men as you walk with God. I don't know about you, but there's, certain, there's some people in my life, great mentors in my life, that just the godliness that flows out of them attracts me to them. Everything that they do, everything they put their hand to, it almost as if it turns to gold. And you, you walk behind them as they listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of people that I want to be with. That's the kind of people that I want to be around. Those that walk in leadership with the Spirit of Almighty God. It doesn't matter what walk of life you're in. Whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a businessman, whether you're a practitioner, a student, whether you're a stay-at-home mo mother, it does not matter what walk of life you're in. The glory of God will surround you as you walk with Him and God will give you favor like you've never had favor before as you walk in the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And listen, your obedience will pour over an abundance of life to your children and your grandchildren and your, and your loved ones. All will feel the benefits of your hard work and obedience and even your children will be the one that they'll rise up and call you blessed. I wouldn't be here, folks, today if it wasn't for my parents. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Everything that they poured into me as a child, all of the decisions that I, I'll never forget. I was, I was growing up, my, my mom and my dad, certain individuals in our life, they just would ridicule and just, why? Why are you so this way and so that way? Why are you so dogmatic? Why are you this? Why are you so, you know, we'd be at the church before the pastor would get there sometimes. We live 30 minutes away and we'd drive. And, you know, my parents would just get up and go. We'd be there. Why are you so dogmatic? Folks, I'm telling you right now, I thank God that my parents were dogmatic. I thank God that they held this standard up here because most of the people that didn't, their children are no longer in the house of God. I'm telling you the truth. Most of the people that I grew up with are nowhere to be found. Some of my best friends still great, great friends. But where are they? Where are they? 
You see, what you, the decisions that you sow in this life, the decisions that you sow, you're not the only one that has to reap it. Your children will reap it. And your children's children will reap it. Are you hearing me? And your children's children's children will reap the decisions that you sow. Oh, I'm just telling you right now, if you walk in obedience to the Spirit of God, I want to be so. I got a little boy. My little boy's back there in that room, three years old. I've got another little one coming next month. I can't wait. We're excited. But you know, I just have these little boys, and I'm every day, God, what am I doing? What am I doing? What decisions am I making that I'm I'm planting for my little boy? What am I doing? Am, am I a godly example? of what you want me to be am I a man of God not just behind the pulpit but at home in my private life in my car wherever I am am I a man of God before these little boys I don't want them to grow up and say well dad was one way on Sunday but he wasn't like that at home folks I want them to fall in love with Jesus Christ I don't want them to fall in love with religion or just going to church I want them to fall in love with Jesus how can they have that unless their father's in love with Jesus? Folks, the decisions that you sow, I've got to speed this up. The decisions that you sow, they matter. The things that you choose to do in life, they, they're not just flippant and just off in the wind. Everything that you plant, every decision that you make will eventually come up. Eventually, it'll come up somewhere. Everything. It's worth waiting and walking in the divine will of God. It's worth sowing seeds of obedience to His will for one day there will come a harvest and that day will be a day of rejoicing and not of mourning. Folks, I can't wait for that great and final day when we get to be with our Lord and Savior. And every decision that we ever made in life, as hard as it was, we made it because we were following the leadership of the Spirit. Folks, it'll pay off. I said it'll pay off. But Saul... To kind of take a different step. Saul continued down this line of obedience to the will of God for nearly two years. Walking in peace and harmony with the Spirit of God. And no doubt the nation of Israel prospered in that period because of Saul's obedience. And you don't hear very much of what went on during those two years. He just walked in obedience. Just following in obedience to the voice of the Spirit of God. But there came a day in the life of this young king that I have yet to figure out. Something transpired within him as he became comfortable in his position. And oftentimes, folks, as we begin our walk with God, we fear and we tremble at his divine leadership, but slowly we get used to his presence. Is it the truth? At the very beginning, we, we, we tremble under the divine leadership of God. As God speaks to us and directs our lives. But little by little we get used to our surroundings. What once was a notable moment in your life now has become a familiar thing. Within our comfort we let our guard down and we begin to think of ourselves something that we ought not to think. We begin to let our, to think ourselves higher than we should with more strength than we actually have. And in the midst of such success and prosperity, Saul began to let something germinate with inside of him that nothing, that no one knew anything about. You know, if I could pull one of these seeds out of this bag, which I can't, and I'm not going to try because I'll make a mess. I put it on the tip of my finger. If you could see it, I'm sure that Harvard would want to look at you because it's, it would be so tiny that it's almost microscopic. They're just very, very small, little seed. And Saul began to let something germinate with inside of him that no one else seen. And it's so easy, folks, as little things begin to germinate with inside of our spirit, it's so easy to just tuck it away. It's so easy to just hide it for just a little while. No one else knew anything about it. A seed of disobedience was planted within his heart and it was just a tiny seed. <coughs> no danger to anything or anyone, so he thought. And he kept it tucked away, hiding it beneath his countenance as he went on about his kingship. And that tiny little seed that Saul allowed to root itself with inside of him was a tiny seed called pride. 
Just a little tiny thing. Just a tiny little thing. Now, folks, we have to understand that sin is subtle. Satan is subtle. He doesn't just come for just to play around with you. He comes to destroy you. Are you hearing me? He doesn't just come to just tickle your fancy and, and, and just leave you alone. He's looking for life. He's looking for blood. Okay? He's looking for blood. And he's not just, you know, just some little thing that's going to last a little while. He comes and he plays for keeps. The Bible says in John 10 and 10 that the, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his end. That's his intent. And if you're playing around with anything, that's the end of it. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he allowed a little tiny seed called pride to germinate with inside of himself. And he said, you know, nobody else knows what's going on. He began to look at himself. He began to attribute all of his success to himself. And he grew comfortable in his leadership and in his kingship Believing that he was God's man for the hour, he began to set himself up for the biggest fall of his life. Let me tell you something, folks. You allow anything, anything in your life, any tiny thing. You might think it's tiny, but a besetting sin, anything in your life. I said, you're setting yourself up for the biggest fall of your life. Proverbs 16, verses 18 says, And pride goeth before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. And usually it doesn't matter what sin you attribute it to. That pride is always clung to it. We have a privacy boundary around us. And this is mine. This is mine. I, you know, I don't have to answer to you. I don't have to answer to anyone. And pride blinds us. But the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Folks, let me tell you something. You dabble in anything. You dabble in any sin. Pride will come right alongside and blind your eyes. But you better turn around because you're setting yourself up for the biggest fall of your life. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen, in your comfort. For in the moment that you remove your guard is the moment that you can lose everything you've ever worked towards. So I was praying this week. I just felt in my spirit that this was the direction. This is where the Spirit of God was leading. Listen, don't ever let your guard down. Are you hearing me? I said, oh, I don't care what people say about you. Don't, don't worry about all that. What does God think? Hold your standard as high as you can get because the moment that you begin to lower your wall, the devil's on the other side waiting to shoot arrows into your spirit. I try to keep it as high as I can. And some people say, Stephen, you know, you don't have to be so dogmatic. You don't have to be so radical. You don't have to have your standard way up here. But I'm telling you something, folks. If I lower it, he's right there. You lower it, he's just waiting, just waiting. Folks, he's done this for 6,000 years. And we think we're so brilliant. You know, I just laugh. Sometimes I just get in study and, you know, I'm kind of strange. Yeah, if you haven't figured that out, you will. But anyways, in study, you know, you just, I get by myself and I start to think about how, how foolish, how much he has us fooled for 6,000 years and billions upon billions upon billions of lives. He's done this too. Yeah, year after year after year from the onset of time to 2014 and we think we can outfox him and outsmart him. Let me tell you something, folks. The only one that can defeat him is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And if you don't have him in your life, folks, it's destruction. He's the one that conquered hell, the death, death, hell, and the grave. But listen, having planted seeds of obedience to his will, all looks fine over the fertile soil of your, or fertile fields of your life. But hear me today, one act of disobedience can cost you the kingdom. One act of disobedience can cost you your reputation. One act of disobedience can and will bring seeds of decay and slowly rot everything that you've ever worked towards. If there's ever anything that you hear me, hear me folks. Don't let it germinate within your spirit because it will destroy you from the inside out. Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 and I'm about to close. The Bible says, be not deceived. 
Don't be deceived. God is not going to be mocked. Whatsoever you plant in the ground, you're the one that's going to have to reap what you plant. If you sow to righteousness, you'll sow, you'll, if you sow seeds of, to the Spirit, you'll sow righteousness. But if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. The law of harvest is no respecter of persons and what, whatever it is that you plant in the ground you will also have to harvest it no matter if it's a whole bag of seed or just one individual seed. Eventually, you're going to have to face what you have planted. Saul made the mistake of his life. And having walked with God for two years, he now thought he had it all figured out. I'm going to lower the wall just a little bit. I've been in this long enough. I've been a Christian long enough. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it figured out. I know how to do it. I know how to act. I know how to, you know, maintain it all in just kind of a religious uh, rolling. And he said, I, I just, I got it figured out. I'm going to let the wall down just a little. Just a little bit more, I'm going to let the wall down. Just a little, I'm going to let the wall down. And folks, let me tell you something. This tiny seed of pride began to take root within his tender heart. And it wasn't long before it caused him to walk away from the divine order of God. It wasn't long before Saul took a departure. For Samuel chapter 13, we all know it. We all know it. Verses 8, he tarried seven days. Samuel said, you go to Gilgal, they're going to fight, going to go to war. You go to Gilgal and you wait until I come. The Bible says that Saul's men were scattered from him. He only had 300 men left. They're hiding in rocks and caves. And Saul just trying to figure out what's going on. Little by little he let that wall down. Samuel's first day, second day, third day didn't show up. Fourth day, fifth, let me tell you something. God always shows up at the right time and at the right place. Are you hearing me? He's never late and he's never early. He's timeless. He doesn't, our, the tick of our clock, he doesn't think about anything about that. He knows when he wants to be there and he knows when he wants to leave. And we best adhere to the Spirit of God. Seventh day come, the morning. I believe it was probably the morning. Saul, the enemy, was out there, the Malachites, or one of them, by the droves, by the thousands, Saul's alone. What am I going to do? Samuel's not here. We have to hear from God. I know. I think I can do that. I think I've got it figured out. I think that I've been in this long enough that I can handle it. And Saul offered that sacrifice and I believe it was just like God when that bullock was laid on that altar and the flames were licking up around it that Samuel came up over the hill. You see, God's always on time. He's never late. He, he's never, he, he never worries about anything. He always, he's always there. And folks, we have to listen. We have to listen to the voice of the Spirit. But after two years of obedience to the will of God, Saul finally came to a place where he thought he knew better. I know better, but God, I, I, I know better. I want to go this direction, folks. You better listen to the voice of the Spirit. Listen, hear to the voice of the Spirit. But Saul had allowed this little seed of pride to germinate within his spirit for quite some time, and he watched. You're wondering what I was going to do with these, but he watched as it broke through the fertile soil of his life in the form of a baby tree, just a tiny tree. And you know, he would watch that sin. He knew it was there. Every day he'd walk by and he would notice that little tree, but it was no threat to him. I've got it under control, he said. I've got it there. It's just, it's just a little tree. It's just a little thing. I, I, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it under control. And he just walk on by. And the next day he'd, he'd walk by and you'd take stock of your life. And you know, folks, you know. You know what's on the inside of your heart. You know when there's something contrary to the will and the mind of God. I feel the Spirit of God this morning. You know, you cannot not know when you're against or going against the grain of the will of God. You know it. It's in your spirit. It doesn't matter how much you try to hide it. And oh, we're so good at masking. We're so good at just putting on a mask and say everything is good. Woo! All is well. But in reality, folks, you know that there's something inside that you need to get rid of. And Saul knew, he knew, he knew it was there. 
And he walked by it every day. Well, but it's just a little tree. And at any time, folks, he could have went over. I'm not going to make a mess. But he could have pulled that thing up out of the ground. But he didn't. And little by little, he left it alone. And you know what happens when you leave sin alone? You know what happens when you leave a little tiny tree alone? Two years ago, or last year, I planted three Cleveland pear trees in my backyard. Five. I planted five Cleveland pear trees in my backyard. They were this, this big when I planted them. They're almost bigger than me now. When you leave it alone and you don't deal with it, when you don't deal with the sin of your own heart, it grows. And it takes deeper root. And it gets deeper and deeper. At any point, Saul could have pulled it up out of the ground, but it just kept getting bigger. But you know, Saul, I still have it under control. I still have it under control. He could have went over. Lowe's wouldn't appreciate me doing that. I could have went over and stepped on it. He could have went over and just crunched it to the ground. But he left it alone. He began to pet it and left it alone. And folks, let me tell you something. You leave it alone long enough and surely, shortly, but it will grow bigger than what you are. Are you hearing me? I said if you leave it alone, it will grow so big that you can't do anything with it now. You can't pull it up by your bare hands. You can't handle it on your own. And what you need to do now is take a Holy Ghost chainsaw and cut the thing down. Hallelujah. And there's some of us in this building this morning that have let things germinate within our spirit. You've left it alone. You've left it alone. You said, I've got it under control. I know how to handle it. But folks, it's gotten out of hand. It's gotten bigger than what you are. And you don't know what to do now. It's so big, folks. The only thing, the only answer is the Holy Ghost of God. I said, He is the only answer. He's the only deliverer. And you've got to pick Him up and allow Him to cut the tree down down if Saul would have only recognized come to terms with himself you know I do need to deal with this you know we I'm not going to belabor this but we do such a good job at evading the truth what I've come to understand about myself because I'm always so searching. Always, folks, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't want to miss God. I don't want to miss God in my life, in my character, my personality. You might say, Stephen, you're, you're gone too far. But folks, I want to please Him. And I'm always so searching. And you know what I've discovered about myself? That this flesh, the Bible says that in me and myself, there is no good thing. The Bible also says in the book of Proverbs that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and who can know it? You know, so many people, this culture, this time, this generation and probably every generation has said, oh, just follow your heart. You just follow your heart, honey. Just follow your heart. That's what we say. Just, you just follow your heart. What do you want to do? Just follow your heart. Where are you going to go? Just follow your heart. Folks, let me tell you something. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. And who can know it? I said, you follow your heart and it'll lead you into destruction. You follow your heart, it'll lead you down a road that you never wanted to go. The only leadership is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I said, it's the leadership of the Holy Ghost of God. He's the one that'll never lead you astray. I said, he's the one that'll cause you to plant in right seed and cause an abundance of crop to come up at harvest time. I want my life to mean something. And in order for it to mean anything, I must be led of the Spirit of the living God. Saul never dealt with that tree. I pray you never look at another tree the same. Every time you pull in your yard, I pray it reminds you because the voice of nature repeats the voice of divine revelation. God is always trying to get the, the human race's attention. His grace is relentless, folks. All the way around us, it's relentless. All constantly trying to get our attention. He never, ever dealt with it. I said at the beginning that Saul became something 
At the end of his life, he started off right. But at the end of his life, he became something totally contrary to the mind and the will of God. And you know what's sad? Majority of the human race goes that way. Majority of us, we never deal with anything. We just live in a bubble. We think that it'll go away on itself, folks. The only thing that'll cause sin to go away is the truth. Let the truth of the Word of God expose it and destroy it at its root. That's the only thing. And I told you a little while ago, I examined just constantly trying to... What I've learned in myself is that self loves to evade the truth. This old Adamic nature, it hates the Word of God. I said it hates the Word. It hates the Spirit of Christ. That's the reason why it's easier to lay out on a Sunday. It's so easy to lay in bed. It's so easy to just, well, I'll go to church next week. But folks, in me and myself, there's no good thing. Stand with me, musicians, if you'd return. Saul went on about the course of his life. And you know, when you come to the end of a man's life, you come to something. And at the end of his life, we find him at the witch of Indoor's house. A man that was anointed. A man that had oil poured out on his head. The Spirit of God spoke and said, Is it not that you are the captain of the Lord's inheritance? He's at the witch of Indoor's house, conjuring up the spirit of Samuel. Samuel, God won't talk to me. I, I can't hear him. I can't, I can't feel him. Samuel said, well, what good am I? If God won't speak to you, what can I do? You disobeyed him, Saul. At the end of his life, folks, the tragedy of it is his actions, his decision poured out on his family. Jonathan went down in that battle. They cut both their heads off, nailed their body to the wall of Dagon, marched their heads through their city. Jonathan wasn't a part of his sin. But because he was in proximity to it, folks, let me tell you something. This is what I'm trying to tell you in closing. What you do, what you sow in this life, it doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody around you. I've watched individuals. One act of disobedience, a spouse. One act of disobedience, destroy a family. And now there's a reproach three generations long. I'm telling you the truth. One sin. One thing that you never dealt with. And the reproach goes on and on. Now when people look at their children, oh, you're his boy. You're her girl. I see. Folks, it's so important that we deal with what's within us. If you don't deal with it, it'll destroy you. I know this was a bit heavier of a message. But I feel that it was needful of the Spirit of God to lead me here. What I've experienced is that we have to have the meat of the Word as well. We have to know what's on the inside and deal with it, folks. The Bible says, examine yourself. Judge yourself now, lest you be judged there. I would much rather deal with myself here make it right here than to know I missed it there I'm going to invite you to this altar I'm not going to pinpoint anybody out folks every one of us have stuff Everyone, I, until you walk on water anybody walk on water ok we're all in the same boat we all have stuff we're all imperfect we're all sinners stuff on the inside that we all have to deal with. So I want us to come. Right now from where you are, I want you to come out. Make your way. Let's just gather around this altar. And say, God, let's sing that song if you could. Create in me a clean heart. Can you sing that song?
create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, oh Lord. Search me, oh God. Come on, folks, search. Soul search. Come out from where you are, if you would. Find yourself somewhere. I know many of you have plans. It's 12 o'clock. I understand. But I do believe that this is important. Come on, let's sing. Let's soul search. Is there anything in me? God, is there anything in me that does not reflect the image of your son? Is there anything in my marriage? Is there anything inside of my spirit that does not resonate with your spirit? Let's just take these moments. At your feet, Lord, I bow. Search me, Hallelujah. oh God. And yes. Examine me, oh God. Take this. Maybe you need to pick up a Holy Ghost chainsaw and cut something out of your life. But I challenge you to do it now. Do it here. Do it before the Lord God Almighty. Yes, I want to be pure. Come on, let's pour ourselves out. Oh my God. I wanna be clean. Oh my God. Yes. Wanna be pure. Yes, Lord. He are rala da 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 da. Shandi a ba 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 ba. He are ba 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 ba. He are rala da 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 da. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh my God. Holy Spirit, is there anything in my heart, anything in my life that does not resemble Christ? Is there anything that I've allowed to remain? Is there any pride? Is there any pride that blinds me from my sin? Oh God, search my heart and try me. See if there be any wicked way. Oh God, we ask you. Oh my God, we pray. Yes, Lord. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Oh my God. Oh my God. You just be real with him, folks. He'll be real with you. He will be real with you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus.
Father, we're just so thankful for your word. Thankful, God, that you're relentless. That your mercy and your grace, it reaches and reaches and reaches. That you never leave us alone and you always call out upon our spirit. Father, I thank you for your timely word. I thank you, God, for your word. Thank you that it's sure. It's a foundation that we can build our lives upon. God, I just pray if there be anything in us as we examine our hearts here this morning and before we leave, I pray, God, if there is, that there would be genuine repentance of our heart. And Father, I pray right now that you'd come by your spirit and you'd soothe and you'd heal as we get rid of things that do not belong. Father, I pray for some as they have to take the strength or that they would have the strength to take that Holy Ghost chainsaw, God, and cut it out. To cut it out of their lives. It's painful, it hurts, but God, it's necessary. Father, I pray this morning that you would be with every one of us as we, as we continually examine our heart as we judge ourselves, not of men, but of God, as we judge ourselves here, that we might be found faithful there. I pray, Father, that you'd be with every one of us. Give us the strength. Give us the strength to honestly look into the mirror of your word. And if there's any imperfection, if there's anything, God, any spot, any wrinkle that we would get rid of. Give us this strength this morning as you let us hear. Be with us, Father, as we enjoy this weekend. And we remember every life that was given that we might live. First and foremost, we thank you for yours, the life of your son. And I pray, Jesus, that you go with us. Christ. I want you to be encouraged this morning. As you spend time with your family and you spend time with your friends and relax. Keep this in your mind. Every seed that I sow or every decision that I make is a seed that goes into my ground. And whatever I plant, I'm going to plant. Lord, help us make the right decisions. Help us sow at the right time. Help us go the right places. Do the right things. Y'all have been a blessing. Y'all are a blessing. As we'd say again, Canada, you guys are a blessing. <laughs> the word of God is sure. Amen. I'm thankful that he, not only does he encourage me and uplift me, but that he deals with me as well. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. I look forward to next Sunday.